Hello and welcome to the Innovation Institute. Today you will be hearing a webinar from Dr. Pam Smith. Stay tuned after the webinar about our final discussion in this series and ways to connect with us. You can also visit previous webinars via our website. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, this is Dr. Pamela Smith. Today we're going to spend some time looking at thyroid disorders and then we're also going to look at a very short webinar on how you write prescriptions for compounded thyroid. So today we're going to concentrate on hypothyroidism. Some of the references are on the slides. Some of them are in my book, What You Must Know About Thyroid Disorders. As you all know, there is more than one thyroid hormone produced by the body. There's T1, T2, T3, and T4. There's a lot of signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, but many of them occur before the lab becomes abnormal. This is very frustrating to the patient because then they think that they have hypothyroidism, the labs look normal, and then everyone is frustrated. So let's review some of the signs and symptoms of low thyroid production. Of course, depression. I really do believe before someone is prescribed an antidepressant that we should look at thyroid function. Weight gain may be the most common reason the patient asks to have thyroid studies done. Constipation, headaches, including migraine, brittle, rich, striated, and thickened nails, rough, dry skin, menstrual irregularities, fluid retention, poor circulation, elbow keratoses, slow speech, Nails that are easily broken can be symptoms of low thyroid production. Anxiety and panic attacks, inability to concentrate and memory not as sharp, muscle and joint pain, reduced heart rate, slow movements, morning stiffness, I always think of two things, rheumatoid arthritis or hypothyroidism. Puffy face, swollen eyelids, decreased sexual interest, cold intolerance, cold hands and feet. I hope you're thinking of your different patients as we go through this. Swollen legs, feet, hands and abdomen, insomnia, fatigue, low body temperature, hoarse, husky voice, low blood pressure, muscle weakness, agitation and irritability, sparse, coarse, dry hair, dull facial expression, the yellow's discoloration of the skin. This can be due to the inability to convert beta carotene into vitamin A. Muscle cramps, droopy eyelids, carpal tunnel syndrome, sleep apnea, endometriosis, compromised immune system. Yes, there's even more. Hypercholesterolemia, infertility, PMS, hyperinsulinemia, fibrocystic breast disease, nutritional imbalances, paresthesias, and of course, myxedema. A downturn mouth is pretty much pathognomonic, acne, allergies, painful menstrual cycles, a tendency to develop allergies, loss of the lateral one third of the eyebrows, otherwise known as Queen Anne sign is pathognomonic for hypothyroidism. Fat pads above the clavicles, hair loss in the front and back of the head, loss of hair in varying amounts from the legs, axle and arms, poor night vision, loss of eyelashes or eyelashes are, that are not as thick. Blepharospasm is more common. Ear canal that's dry, scaly and itchy. Even excess cerumen in the ear canal can be a symptom of hypothyroidism. Iron deficiency anemia, B12 deficiency, tinnitus. Tinnitus is such a hard one. People really hate ringing in the ears, but some people can be helped by treating their hypothyroidism. Delayed cheap dendron reflexes, low amplitude of theta and delta waves, bipolar disorders, schizoid, effect of psychoses, miscarriage, dizziness and vertigo, congestive heart failure, acute MI, decreased coronary output, in fact, even coronary artery disease itself, arrhythmias, increased risk of developing asthma, hypertension, mild elevation of liver enzymes, 
and they really don't have major liver disease. Gallstones, bladder and kidney infections being more common, eating disorders, increased appetite, deposition of mucin in the connective tissues, muscular pain, hyperhomocysteinemia. As you all know, the patient has high homocysteine, there's an increased risk in heart disease, stroke, cognitive decline, bone loss, and so much more. High C-reactive protein, arthralgias and joint stiffness, menorrhagia, recurrent miscarriage, nocturia, easy bruising, even erectile dysfunction can be a symptom of hypothyroidism, hypoglycemia, shortness of breath, impaired kidney function, bone loss. So there's some references to all of that. There may be some connection between adrenal dysfunction and primary or secondary hypothyroidism that can occur together. In fact, people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, meaning positive thyroid antibodies, they may also have positive adrenal cortex antibodies. Cortisol levels may elevate to compensate for low T3 when this happens. Some of these could be signs and symptoms, we're really not sure. Vitiligo certainly is an autoimmune disease. A number of autoimmune diseases are connected with hypothyroidism, dry eyes. Dry eyes are commonly inflammatory, but sometimes they're related to hypothyroidism. Skin cancer, TMJ, retrograde uterus, and growth hormone deficiency in children. T4 is less active than T3, but the body needs to make that conversion from T4 to T3. What things actually cause decreased production of T4? Just a lot of people just need a multivitamin. Deficiency of zinc, copper, vitamins A, B2, B3, B6, and vitamin C can cause a decreased conversion. That conversion does require the enzyme 5' prime diiodinase. There's three 5' prime diiodinases, type one, which is located in the thyroid, liver, and kidneys. It plays a very important role in the production of T3. Type two, found in the pituitary, hypothalamus, and brown fat, converts T4 to T3. Type three, catalyzes deionization of the inner ring of T4 and T3, which inactivates the hormone. So these are elements that affect 5' prime deionase production. Selenium deficiency. I practice in Michigan. We're low here in selenium. We're also low in iodine. So you can imagine how much hypothyroidism we have here. But look at the next one, stress. Who isn't stressed in today's world? Cadmium, mercury, or lead toxicity. I do suggest measuring toxic metals in patients. Starvation, inadequate protein intake, high carb diet, elevated cortisol, chronic illness, decreased kidney or liver function, inflammation, affects by prime diiodinase production. Starting at about the age of 45, every single disease that a patient can get, all of them are inflammatory in nature. Remember a little bit of inflammation heals too much, again, is related to disease. There's other factors that cause an inability to convert T4 to T3. Some of these nutritional deficiencies we've been talking about are certainly some of them. So can medications like beta blockers, oral contraceptives, estrogen, phenytoin, lithium, theophylline, some chemotherapeutic agents, amiodarone, and propothiouracil. Now, some of the reasons that medications can be problematic is that nutritional depletions are caused by medications. Every medicine that we all prescribe causes between two and 10 nutritional depletions. So let's take oral contraceptives and estrogen. They both have estrogen in them. Oral estrogens and estrogens given otherwise deplete the body of some of the B vitamins that are needed to make the thyroid work. Glucocorticoids, interleukin-6, thimipramine, and then a diet 
yes, you can have too much of a good thing. Too many cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, cauliflower, all of these are really, really important to help estrogen break down. But if you sat around all day long and ate them, your patient may have a problem with conversion of T4 to T3. A low protein diet, low fat diet, low carb diet, excess alcohol use, and walnuts. Also soy. Other things that can negatively impact the conversion of T4 to T3, the aging process, excess alpha lipoic acid. This is one that I think is little known from Bert Bergson's work because he looks at high dose alpha lipoic acid to treat some diseases, for example, hepatitis C. He suggests in his work that 30% of people with hep C can actually be cured with high dose alpha lipoic acid. I actually do have a nurse in my practice who was cured of hepatitis C by high dose alpha lipoic acid, but it does negatively impact thyroid. It does impact the conversion of T4 to T3. She did become hypothyroid permanently, but what a great trade-off. What is this dose of alpha lipoic acid? 600 milligrams and above. She's on 600 milligrams BID. She still takes that number and she's also on thyroid medication. So anytime you go to 600 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid, it can negatively impact T4 to T3. Diabetes, fluoride, lead and mercury, pesticides, radiation stress, and GI infections can all affect this conversion. So can surgery, copper and calcium excess, dioxins and PCBs, we do measure those as well. Lyme disease, toxic metal syndrome, I'm sorry, toxic mold syndrome, viral infections, phthalates, and inadequate production of DHEA and cortisol. There are factors that are associated with low T3 or increased reverse T3. Remember, T3 is five times more active than T4. So you want T3 to be available for the body to use. Increased epinephrine and norepinephrine, free radical production, aging, fasting, stress, prolonged illness, diabetes, toxic metal exposure, elevated levels of interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and IFN-2, all of these affect and are associated with low T3 or increased reverse T3. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. These factors increase the conversion of T4 to T3, selenium. The patient can get toxic, so you do need to measure. Potassium, iodine, same thing, the patient can get toxic, please measure. Urine is the best way to measure iodine. Iron, zinc, high protein diet, and the herb ashwagandha. Now, how much actual iron does it take? For menopausal women and men, the ferritin should be 100 for the conversion. For women who are still cycling, then it does take the ferritin to be 130 to make this conversion. Other things that increase T4 to T3, vitamins A, B2, vitamin E, growth hormone, and testosterone if needed. Insulin if needed, glucagon, melatonin. We do measure levels of melatonin as well. That's a saliva test. Tyrosine, and then the last one I do not recommend. Overdose of estrogen can increase the conversion, but that's not something we want to do. When we order labs, one of the biggest mistakes that occurs in modern medicine is that people just get a TSH or they get just a TSH and a free T4 only. Then we miss about 50% of people that are actually hypothyroid. So it's important to get all of these studies, TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, and thyroid antibodies. Sometimes we also need to get a TBG, thyroid binding globulin. It stores thyroid hormone, it's produced in the liver, It's affected by illness, liver disease, and some medications, and estrogens can increase thyroid bonding globulin, which makes less thyroid 
available for the body to use. TRH, also called TRF, also may be important to look at. You do want to look at what stimulates the pituitary. So this is made in the hypothalamus. It does stimulate the release of TSH and prolactin from the pituitary. There is a relationship between celiac disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis in some patients. 70% of people who are hypothyroid, 70% of people that are hypothyroid do have Hashimoto's. Not everyone, however, with Hashimoto's thyroiditis is hypothyroid. I probably have maybe seven or eight patients in my practice that have Hashimoto's, but they have perfect thyroid function. A medical trial referenced here looked at patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and gluten-free. There's three things I recommend for every patient with any autoimmune disease, including Hashimoto's. No gluten, fix the gut, and start low-dose naltrexone. So no gluten, fix the gut, start low-dose naltrexone. This study actually showed from 2018 that a gluten-free diet reduced thyroid antibody titers. And I certainly do see that in my practice. So there's the things we need to do. LDN. In recent years, there's been some novel and significant findings on the off-label usage of naltrexone. Now, naltrexone, we all know, is for what? naltrexone we use for drug overdose. But in low doses, low dose naltrexone, it can act as an immune modulator in most autoimmune diseases and even malignant tumors, really honestly any disease process that's inflammatory. It does have to be compounded. So with low dose naltrexone, there are many dosage protocols. The most common one used for autoimmune diseases for an adult is the following. 1.5 milligrams an hour before bedtime, week one. Then the patient takes two tablets an hour before bedtime, week two for three milligrams. And then the third week they take three tablets, which is 4.5 milligrams. Some people do develop insomnia the first night. It usually resolves after that. If it does not, then we have the patient take it at 6 p.m. Week four and thereafter, we have compounded just a single 4.5 milligram tablet. I have many patients on low dose naltrexone, autoimmune diseases, prevention of memory loss, treatment of memory loss, weight loss, cancer, and even other disease processes as well. Anything that's inflammatory. The results of increasing studies indicate that LDN exerts its immunomodulatory activity by binding to opioid receptors in an non-immune and uh, tumor cells. These new discoveries indicate that LDN may become a promising immunomodulatory agent in the therapy for cancer and many immune-related diseases. There's your reference for that. And there's your dosage. Hashimoto's thyroiditis patients are frequently iron deficient, so make sure you measure not just TIBC, but make sure you actually measure the ferritin itself. In this study from 2019, two thirds of women with persistent symptoms of hypothyroidism, despite appropriate level thyroxine therapy, restoring their serum ferritin to at least 100 really did help. Still looking at Hashimoto's, lower vitamin D status has been found in Hashimoto's thyroiditis patients. So it may be helpful in many immune or autoimmune diseases to look at vitamin D, but please measure it in Hashimoto's. You'll find patients are usually suboptimal. The perfect level of vitamin D is 55 to 80 as long as the patient does not have a granulomatous disease, active cancer, or another reason the calcium would go up with vitamin D. Now, why do I say that? Grant, Garland, and other uh, people who have done research have discovered that 55 to 80 helps prevent breast cancer and probably prostate cancer as well. 
Adequate selenium intake is vital in areas where iodine deficiency and excess and regions of low iodine. In Michigan, most of my patients actually need 200 micrograms. Depending on where you practice, it does matter. So please measure mm -hmm. selenium levels, particularly in women. Sometimes the labs are not perfect. They don't tell us everything. Having the basal body temperature done is important. Take the temperature axillary for 10 minutes for three days before the patient gets out of bed. If the patient is cycling, then take the temperature during the menstrual cycle. So I actually go through this with the patient so they can do this themselves. Lots of treatments when it comes to thyroid. It's not just, hi, here's your medication. And that's what I really love about a personalized medicine approach is that we can help each patient's needs. Some people just need detoxification and has majorly affected thyroid function. PCBs, dioxins, phthalates, heavy metals, lead, arsenic, and mercury. And yes, I have had patients, thyroid function go back to normal when I treated their high mercury levels. T4 has little physiological activity. It must be converted to T3 to be utilized by the cells. This conversion takes place in the liver and kidneys. As I mentioned before, T3 is five times stronger than T4. And T4 has never been proven to be effective for treating hypothyroidism in a long-term study. In fact, everybody prescribed armor thyroid until I was an intern in 1978. And they came around and they told all of us, hey, there's this new medicine out, it's just T4. People really don't need T3 and T4, which is what Armour Thyroid is. And they convinced all of us to only give T4. And this held true until a patient in 1998 sued the FDA because she wanted T3 and T4 and her doctor wouldn't give it to her because they said, oh, people only need T4. At that time, it was found out there was no long-term study that was done. There still isn't a long-term study. Intracellular thyroid hormone receptors have a high affinity for T3. In fact, 90% of the thyroid hormone molecules that bind with the receptors are T3, and only 10% are T4. If the patient's not able to metabolize thyroid, then they're not going to be as healthy. Here's the clinical trial. So how do we fix this? They actually studied it, and 98% of people need to be prescribed T3 and T4. 2% of people, T4 is perfect. Recently, in the last month, I had a new patient come in to my practice, and she came in specifically wanting T3 and T4. But when we did her thyroid studies and we repeated them, she only needed T4. Yes, she was hypothyroid. It would have been really a discredit to the patient, literally malpractice to have given her T3. Her T3 was fine. She only needed T4. So it took us a little while to get her to understand there is science behind all of this. So 98% of people do need both T3 and T4. You can obviously prescribe them by themselves. You can use a desiccated or porcine thyroid, or you can have compounded thyroid replacement prescribed for the patient. In these studies, there is a direct effect on mitochondrial function when you look at T3. It also has a direct effect on the heart. So we can't just ignore T3. We do have to measure the free T3 levels. These are the T4s that are available in the United States. All are immediate release. Many of them contain lactose, which can interfere with thyroid absorption as much as 80%. These are the T3s, all very immediate release. And these are by and large the desiccated thyroids. As you can see, all of them are approximately four parts T4 to one part T3. This ratio is not perfect for every single patient. 
If it's not perfect, then we have it compounded. It can be any ratio you want it to be. One to one, 10 to one, 20 to one, four to one. It can be anything you want if you have it compounded. You can also add selenium, chromium, zinc, and iodine and iodide to the compound if you desire. And yes, there are references looking at this in the medical literature. Believe it or not, people can think, oh my gosh, none of this has been shown. I put 1994 and 1998 here so that everybody realizes that for a long time, we have been looking at comparing T4 and T3 and people needing both. In this study from the Annals of Internal Medicine 2005, lab results were not better, but the patient felt better with both T3 and T4. It does matter where the TSH sits. In anti-aging medicine, we looked at this many years ago where we looked at 80,000 patients that were healthy. The average TSH in North America for a healthy person is 1.5. So we set our upper limit of normal to two millimolar or 2.0. Endocrinologist in 2004, they looked at this as well and they set their upper limit of normal of TSH to 2.5. And it has changed in the labs. When I first started practicing 5.5 was the upper limit of normal of TSH, then it went to five. A lot of labs are now 4.5 and some are four. But from a personalized medicine approach, upper limit of normal is two for optimal function, endocrinology 2.5. So in this study from the Journal of Hypertension, women with the TSH levels in the upper reference ranges, like four, have increased arterial stiffness compared to women with lower TSH. This study was done on postmenopausal women. So here's your optimal levels, TSH up to two. We want the free T3, free T4, reverse T3 to be dead center of normal. Other studies have shown that it's now time for a personalized thyroid replacement to be prescribed for patients. And the word personalized is used in both of these trials. Newer research, this is from 2016, suggests mechanisms for the inadequacies of uh, T4 monotherapy, and it does highlight the possible role for a personalized approach. So understanding these historical events that we just went through is imperative if we wanna help our patients. Remember the thyroid regulates the entire body. It is the conductor of the hormonal symphony. Is it important to get an elevated reverse T3? Yes. And some insurances do not pay for this. I have tried my hardest to find out why. We could help patients so much if we looked at reverse T3. High normal or elevated reverse T3. High normal or elevated reverse T3 is indicative of reduced thyroid transport. This is usually a mitochondrial problem. In other words, there's not enough fuel to get thyroid hormone into the cell where it's needed. So any disease process, any disease process associated with mitochondrial dysfunction may be associated with high normal or elevated reverse T3. So lots of studies. So what are these actual conditions? Insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity chronic and acute dieting, depression, anxiety, bipolar depression, neurodegenerative disorders, almost all of them actually, the aging process, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. In fact, in fibromyalgia, they measured ATP levels. 20% reduction in the level of ATP and muscle biopsies taken from patients diagnosed with fibro. There were lower levels of ATP inside the cells and in their reservoirs, the areas that had normal tissue, there was no ATP deficits. Migraine headaches can be associated 
with an elevated reverse T3, chronic infections, cardiovascular disease, inflammation and other chronic illnesses, high cholesterol, high triglycerides. So an elevated reverse T3, the transporter for T4 is more energy dependent than the transporter for T3. So sometimes this is literally an energy problem. It's kind of like having a Mercedes and putting low octane fuel into the gas tank. It doesn't work that way. Cellular levels of thyroid are not detected well by serum T4 because T4 is transported into the cell and the lower the cellular level of T4, the higher the level you see in the serum. So that explains why sometimes patients feel like, oh, I'm just not doing any better because it's not reflective of what's really going on inside the cell. The most important determinant of thyroid activity is the intracellular level of T3. So again, high normal or elevated reverse T3 is the best measure of thyroid transport. So what do you do if reverse T3 is high in the patient? Well, if they're on T4, take them off or add T3. Excess reverse T3 will further inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3. So we do need to do something. Free T3 and reverse T3 occupy the same receptor sites. T3 will activate the receptor, reverse T3 does not. So if reverse T3 is high, the patient will have symptoms of hypothyroidism and their labs could look perfectly normal. So since reverse T3 is derived from T4, that's the reason you wanna lower the T4 dose or take the patient off and give T3. What else can we do? Well, I put down here eliminating stress. Perhaps I should have put lower stress. I'm not sure we can eliminate it. Growth hormone if needed, but that's the last hormone we look at. If they're selenium or iron deficient, then give them that nutrient. Treat infection is if present, and then they may just need some nutrients for mitochondrial support. A recent retrospective study looked at long-term, 27 months, thyroid replacement with a combination of T3 and T4 to compare it between the two forms of therapy, synthetic versus natural. The authors did not identify additional risk of AFib. They didn't look at cardiovascular disease, mortality, et cetera. But what they did find is that the TSH did need to be optimal. It needed to be perfect and not 5.5. Again, the TSH level is a poor uh, correlation really of what is going on inside the thyroid. So you can't use that alone. Another trial, small decrease in cellular ATP resulted in a major reduction in transport of T4 and reverse T3, but it only slightly affected the T3 uptake. So you have to look at all of these. This study concluded that it's not appropriate to use T4 by itself if the patient has <laughs> mitochondrial dysfunction. This study, connection between and the combination of T4 to T3 is needed to normalize levels of T3 in the tissue. Another study. So you can see that there are things that we can do. So the TSH level, again, poor way of looking at this. So when we look at thyroid replacement, it should be taken on an empty stomach. Sometimes I see the patients are not instructed. Nothing, no vitamins, food, nutrients, anything, an hour before or an hour after. Calcium does interfere with the absorption. These agents lower the absorption or increase the excretion of thyroid. Iron, so it should be taken at a different time. Sucrophate, bile acid sequestrants, like cholestyramine. Lactose, calcium carbonate, aluminum hydroxide. These other medicines affect thyroid function. Haloperidol, lithium blocks iodine transport, amiodarone, oral contraceptives, and everything else on this page. 
these medications increase the clearance of thyroid hormone, dilantin, tegretol, phenobarb, and tamoxifen used for more than one year. Dilantin, tegretol, and phenobarbital, by the way, all deplete the body of vitamin D. Patients that are vitamin D deficient, as we mentioned, can have problems with their thyroid. They also have an increased risk in seizures. Other medicines that increase the clearance, rivanthin, retinavir, and citrulline. So the metabolism of thyroid hormone does require iodine. 80% of circulating T3 comes from the peripheral monodeionization of T4 at the thyrosol ring. 70% of the T4 secreted daily is deionated by, and it yields T3 plus reverse T3 in equal parts. There's other pathways as well. When we look at the stool, some of this does get metabolized in the gut through decarboxylation. In the study of 89 patients with hypothyroidism, they were treated with T4 previously compared to the group of people with low thyroid function that were untreated. Symptoms of patients already on T4, they were not any different than people that didn't even take thyroid medicine. So again, 98% of people will do better if they get T3 and T4. You do need to consider the health of the patient before giving thyroid replacement. This is imperative. Make sure that you always look at the adrenal glands. You want to measure DHEA and cortisol by saliva testing. If you do not do that in your practice, then the compounding pharmacy can help you with this. They are happy to give the patient a saliva test to measure DHEA and cortisol because this is what happens. If the patient's cortisol is really high or really low and you give the patient thyroid medicine and you haven't done anything about the adrenals, then people can get heart racing, they can get a headache, symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and they're not even hyperthyroid. Their TSH could be four. Their T3 and T4 could even be low. So you have to address the adrenals first. If the patient starts to feel more fatigue when the thyroid dosage is increased, this is indicative of inadequate adrenal, of, uh, indicative of adrenal fatigue or overdosage of thyroid replacement. So when we prescribe thyroid, same thing we all learned in school, what do we do? We repeat the levels in six weeks. Every time there's a dosage change, we repeat the level in six weeks. And then I'd like to suggest to you, you repeat the levels every six months once they're on the correct dose, because stress, again, does negatively impact thyroid function. There's a discussion in the medical literature whether you should start someone on thyroid medicine if they've never been on it, if they've had an acute MI. So you may want to wait a little while. Don't give sustained release if the gut's not healthy, and low magnesium levels can interfere with the patient's ability to tolerate thyroid replacement. They may have irregular heart rhythms. So get an RBC magnesium and make sure that's perfect as well. Chronic exposure to mold can interfere with the body's ability to tolerate thyroid replacement. This is from William Ray's work. So you can do um, testing where you look at mold and see if the patient has toxic mold syndrome. Recent studies have shown that toxic mold syndrome is a cause of Parkinson's disease. <laughs> Have to look at iodine. Iodine is more than just thyroid. It's antibacterial, anti-cancer, antiparasitic, antiviral, mucolytic <laughs> agent. So iodine is needed for the production of thyroid hormones. 150 to 290 micrograms is the average dose. No one needs more than 1,100 micrograms a day as an adult. And that's from the U.S. Institute of Medicine. <laughs> These conditions can be helped with iodine. Fibrocystic breast disease, Dubuquin's contractions. Excess mucus production, fatigue, hemorrhoids, headaches, including migraine, keloids, ovarian cysts, parotid duct stones, peronies, sebaceous cysts, and of course, thyroid. 
According to the World Health Organization, 72% of the world's population is affected by iodine deficiency. So again, the ground can be deplete. Diets without ocean fish or sea vegetables like seaweed tend to be deplete. Uh, here in the Midwest, we are deplete, so it's really hard to find salt that's not iodinized. They do put iodine in it. Diets that are high in pastas and breads, they contain bromide. Bromide binds to the iodine receptors and the patient can have low iodine. Fluoride inhibits iodine binding and people who are vegetarians and vegans may have low iodine. Sucralose can deplete the body of iodine and any medication, I listed a few here, there's others that are low in bromide or fluoride can cause iodine deficiency. All these tissues use iodine, thyroid, breast, prostate, kidney, spleen, liver, the blood itself, salivary glands and intestines. You use thyroid replacement hormone without first correcting iodine, then later on, their patient may actually have an exacerbation of their iodine deficiency. Also what can happen is if you use thyroid replacement and then you back into iodine, you give it later, the patient may need less thyroid medication. Areas of the world with high iodine intake like Japan have a lower rate of breast cancer. So great for breast tissue. Usually when we give people iodine, we use a combination of iodine and iodide we remeasure again in three to six months. Many patients don't need iodine after that. If they do, then most patients don't need it daily, maybe once a week, twice a week. About one third of the patients being treated for hypothyroidism will need that lower dose of thyroid hormone if they're already on it. You don't wanna overtreat people. You don't wanna just say, hey, take iodine. There are studies showing that with patients, if you give too much iodine long-term, this can cause an inflammatory response and the patient can get thyroiditis. They also have an increased risk in getting thyroid cancer. There's your optimal levels of iron for thyroid function. Soy can have a negative impact. And then selenium, critically ill patients supplemented with 200 micrograms of selenium normalized thyroid function. We do want to measure that selenium. Zinc supplementation helps thyroid hormone metabolism. Some people do have thyroid resistance, literally. They end up inheriting a gene. They have a single nucleotide polymorphism. They may have too much stress. They may have a mitochondrial issue. All these things can cause thyroid resistance meaning you give thyroid hormone and it doesn't seem to work for the patient. And there are 100 different mutations that can cause a problem with thyroid receptors. Now I've been mentioning several times now about mitochondrial issues and mitochondrial defects. So how do you actually fix the mitochondria? Number one, it needs magnesium. So please write this down or put it in your tablet. Four to 600 microgram or milligrams is a great place to start with magnesium. Magnesium glycinate or three and eight. Number two, what else can you give? NADH, 10 milligrams BID. D-ribose, 15 grams. Alpha lipoic acid, at least 100 milligrams. Most people need three to 400. Coenzyme Q10, three to 400 milligrams, and L-carnitine, 2000 milligrams a day. Now for the L-carnitine, you do need to measure TMAO levels first. Measure TMAO can be done at any lab, any major hospital, lab core, quest, et cetera. If the patient has a high TMAO level, then we cannot supplement with carnitine. We cannot supplement with choline. Those people should not eat red meat and should not eat eggs yolks. That's about 1% of the population. These diseases are associated with hypothyroidism. So let's look at all of them. ADHD, 
and thyroid resistance. Some studies have shown that ADHD is very common among people with generalized resistance to thyroid hormone, and that ADHD is improved with thyroid replacement. Elevated CRP levels are associated with hypothyroidism. So one way to get that CRP down is obviously to decrease inflammation, and give fish oil. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a number of ways to get it down, but treating the thyroid if the patient's hypothyroid is another way. Same thing with homocysteine. Poor methylation can be a symptom of hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Low ratios of T3 to reverse T3 is a predictor of mortality in people with congestive heart failure. VTAC associated with low T3 or low T3, T4 and increased reverse T3. Even in this study, low T3 predictive of an increase in AFib post coronary artery bypass graft. And low T3 is a strong predictor of death in cardiac patients. It increases arterial stiffness. And here, elevated reverse T3, the strongest predictor of mortality in the first year post acute MI. So of course we should be looking at reverse T3. In this study, from the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, T3 improves depression when added to SSRIs and post-traumatic stress disorder. Almost every patient I've seen, at least 95% of people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, they are autoimmune diseases, they're hypothyroid, ankylosing spondylitis, insulin resistance. In this study, lower TSH and higher T4 are associated with improved insulin sensitivity, higher HDL, and better yeah. endothelial function. And then of course, thyroid regulates everything in the body. That does also mean memory. In this study, free T4 levels were related to measurements of language. Improving T4 did help with memory. And in this study, most important contribution for the development of small intestinal bowel overgrowth in ascending order are immunosuppression, impairment of intestinal clearance, and thyroid function. So make sure you look at this as well. So in conclusion, optimal thyroid function does require adequate nutritional intake. It does matter if there's toxic exposure. It does matter what medications they're on. There's many factors that determine thyroid function. You want to help your patient because the science is here for a personalized approach. 98% of people do best if they're prescribed T3 and T4. 2% need T4 by itself. But again, the science is here to help every patient have a perfect thyroid function. Now let's take a second and look at how you literally prescribe compounded thyroid, because we always have a lot of questions on this. So let's look at it. So this is a case history of my own patient, a 52-year-old female who presented to our office who was already seeing a functional medicine practitioner. Um, that I should say she did not do hormone replacement. She was interested in having her hormones balanced. So that's why she arrived. Past history, osteopenia, high cholesterol, hypothyroidism, anemia, secondary to heavy cycles and intense stress. She's married to a dentist with a history of ETOH abuse. She did not work outside the home. She had two children that are in college. Father's 82, has macular degeneration, AFib, CAD, hypertension. Mother died at the age of 50 of liver cancer. One sister has ovarian, two aunts, and two of her other sisters had breast cancer. One aunt has psoriasis. So she wanted to have hormone replacement. And again, the doctor she was seeing did not do this. So she came to us for it, but she was already on thyroid replacement and she was on nature throid two grains. She's allergic to erythromycin. She was taking the nutrients that are listed here. And her LMP was two weeks ago. She does have migraine headaches related to her cycles. 
her physical was normal. So what do we want to do with this patient? Well, a salivary test was done to look at hormonal balance. She was on oral contraceptives and her saliva test was only partially accurate. It does take six months to get synthetic hormones off the receptor sites. She was low in progesterone because she was on progestin. So we started her on progesterone and talk her, took her off the oral contraceptives. It does increase her risk of getting pregnant. So she opted for another form of birth control. It's important to let the patient know that. She had many repeat salivary tests over the years and her sex hormones are currently balanced. She's now menopausal. So we're going to look at what happened with her thyroid because it was interesting. Another doctor was managing this. Her iodine test was done. Her test was normal. So she was continuing on iodine that she came to us on. Blood work was done and she was overdosed on T3 on her nature thyroid. So we needed to do something about this. So we very gently talked to her. I did call the doctor that was prescribing her thyroid. The number one reason you could have problems with the medical board anywhere in the world is overprescribing the thyroid. I did not get very far with him. His response to me was, well, she feels so much better when I give her too much medicine. If you, the patient feels so much better when you've given her too much thyroid medicine and suppressed TSH, that means you've missed another hormone. You've missed another hormone, commonly cortisol. So we wanted to get her the right ratio. So how did we do that? These are some of her labs. So a little merry-go-round there. There's her high T3. TSH was not perfect. A little bit better. There's her suppressing of TSH. Suppressed again, suppressed again. We really did try. There's her T3 4.5. She was on armor thyroid or nature thyroid through all of these. She did get to normal there in 2019, and then she had problems with her marriage, so she had more stress. So here's what happened to her. She got better. Then, oh my goodness, look at this. Her TSH is 6.36. That's when she filed for divorce. She's still overprescribed. Still overprescribed. So at that point in time, we took over what we were going to do from the other doctor. This is three years that we went through this. She was started on level thyroxine. She was started on Synthroid as a DAW, Armor Thyroid. She was on Nature Thyroid. She went through all of these different things on here. She didn't want to take compound thyroid. Initially, she was perimenopausal, so her other hormones were jumping up and down. Her ferritin was low, that negatively impacted it as well. But all these other factors do too. Aging, alcohol, chemotherapy, cigarettes, diabetes, fasting, growth hormone deficiency, heavy metals, iodine, diiodinase gene variation, we now know that, kidney and liver disease, low progesterone she had, other medicines, nutrient deficiencies, obesity, pesticides, radiation, stress, soy surgery, and low ferritin. She had a fair number of those that negatively impact the conversion of T4 to T3. The patient now has perfect thyroid studies. She asked her husband to move out. The divorce has been going on for quite some time. Her stress improved, her cortisol improved. She's now on compounded thyroid which gives her the perfect balance because not everybody, it's not perfect to have four parts T4 to one part T3. She's now menopausal. Everything is stable as well. Compounded thyroid is the hardest medication there is to make. Fortunately, you all are working with a pharmacy that I use myself that does a very good job to compound thyroid. You can always send it to Eagle Analytical Lab or another lab to confirm the compounded thyroid was made correctly. So I'm sending you all a chart that I keep on my desktop 
to help with compounding. So it's going to the pharmacist and they're gonna give everybody a copy. So we're gonna work from that chart, but I also put some slides in here as well to show you how we're gonna do this. We're gonna take one case, make sure DHA and cortisol are normal clinical pearl, okay? So that has to be fixed before you give thyroid medicine. The patient's already on thyroid, as we saw, iodine can negatively affect it. So let's see. Here is one that you can look at. I'm sending the pharmacist one, so you all have one as well. So no problems there as far as that is concerned. But you can also have these as a comparison of nature thyroid, WT thyroid, synthetic T4, armor, and NP thyroid. So you have a basic idea of how to help. And Terra and Innovations can help you with all of this or the other pharmacist. Here's a different one, natural desiccated thyroids. So 44 year old female, her blood work revealed the following, her T3 was too high. She was on armor already, which is T4, 38 plus T3, nine likes. So how do you fix this? If she came to you on armor 60, take the patient off of armor, put her on compound. How do you write the prescription? So we wanna decrease the T3 component. So we did that. We increased the T4 a little bit because her TSH was above two and her T4 was not dead set of normal. So her compounded T4 went to 42 up, her T3 went down to five. I only give 60 days because we're gonna repeat again in six weeks. It was perfect. In the second case, 25 year old Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So nutritional studies were normal. She was taken off of gluten. And when I wrote this for you, this is a new patient to me. Her gut death was still pending. Her TSH is four. Her antibodies are positive. You can see that her free T3 is dead center of normal, but her free T4 is low. So what do we do? We did give her Synthroid 25 micrograms as a DAW. I have described to give or discovered to give level thyroxin as a non-DAW, it doesn't work. If I give armor or any of the desiccated thyroids, I always do DAW as well. Repeat thyroid studies in six weeks. If the thyroid lab is perfect, then every six months. And this patient is a 55 year old male who's been taking armor thyroid prescribed by another doctor. Again, these are all my patients. The TSH obviously was suppressed. The patient was on armor 120, way too much T3, a little too much T4. So armor thyroid 120 is T4 76 plus T3 18. So what do we do? We compound. So the patient was on what? Too much T4 slightly, way too much T3. So we changed it to T4 70, T3 6, 60 days, repeat labs in six weeks. Perfect, no problems whatsoever. Perfect, have perfect levels. So that ratio of T4 to T3 is not always right. What do you do? You compound it. So you can have a personalized approach for every single patient. That's what that compounding is about. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the webinar today. We hope you got some great takeaway information from what you learned today and that you learned something new. We designed the Innovation Institute to provide you with the tools and education that you need to grow your practice and increase your knowledge base. My name is Tara Thompson, a pharmacist at the Innovation Institute, and we encourage you to sign up for Dr. Smith's other webinars by visiting our website at www.innovationcompounding.com. There you can also sign up to view previous webinars in the library or sign up for future ones by Dr. Smith. As always, we are here for your questions and feedback, so please reach out to us. Thank you for listening today and be well.